apiece. So when we got to voting on spending $900 for 1,500 carnations, I had to figure out which one of you is the delegate from each church that gets to vote on doing this. It usually isn't a problem. It's a unanimous vote on that. Now, I wanted, Craig said that he wanted me to tell some of the stories that I told him. Did you pick one? I, I don't want to. Let me run down through these really, really quick. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, during Pride, every shift, we have an ordained pastor present in the tents to meet with people throughout the day. And the stories of pastoral care that they have provided to Pride attendees is just amazing. Kirkwood United Church of Christ had one of those encounters, and because of that encounter, they've seen significant growth in their membership from the LGBTQIA community. A couple learned about St. Mark United Church of Christ in rural Missouri, also part of the St. Louis Association, and decided to drive 45 minutes each way to come and become a member of that church and to be married in that congregation because they met the pastor at Broad. At our annual convocation one year in Parkway UCC, we had an arts festival, sort of arts program, and during that program, the organist of that church felt like this was the first state safe space in his life, and he's 66 years old now, and he came out to the 200 people gathered at the convocation for the first time. We learned of a family that was being bullied in their, it was a non-UCC church, and they were told to leave the church uh, and get out. And they've been lifelong members of that church. They contacted a friend who contacted another friend who contacted a pastor of uh, Open and Affirming Church. And they joined that church, but it also led us to start a program to have a resource line where people could find a telephone number to call when those kinds of things happen. It's also interesting to hear people find us at Pride and at other events and say, oh my gosh, there is a church for me. And on the 23rd of July, there will be an ordination. And at one of our monthly meetings, Tim Powers Reed, who will be ordained on the 23rd of July in the afternoon, was on Zoom participating in the meeting. And so was Jeanette Mott Oxford, who we referred to as JMO. She is the one who said, we will fight the police and we will have drag bingo. I don't care what they say. Tim had just completed the process and had just been approved for ordination pending call and had just received a call in this meeting. And he pointed out to the group that Tim Powers Reed will be the first gay person ordained in the Illinois South Conference. Jeanette Mott Oxford, also at that meeting, said, and I am the first out lesbian woman who was denied ordination by the Illinois South Conference. At that point, Tim broke out practically in tears, which I'm going to be in a minute, and said, I want to do at my ordination. I heard your story, and I didn't know how to get in touch with you. I want you at my ordination. And she'll be there. But the, person, the first person ordained and the first person denied ordination were side by side in that meeting on Zoom. And they will be ordained. He will be ordained on the 23rd of July. And... The last story I had was one I'd already told. Would you sit down? <laughs> now, hold this. Uh oh. Uh, woo! Woo! <laughs> I, know, I was going to try to do this, but I was too busy to read the script, right? So I went, I went, and I get music. <laughs> so after our first Pride event, I started to notice that we were really badly organized. You know, things had gone bad and we were badly organized. And one of the things I noticed was everybody had a t-shirt, right? And I didn't want to wear this all morning and give away the effect of showing off my t-shirt. But we did t-shirts like this. And I see these now show up at General Synod on people I don't even know. During the pandemic, our pride event became a parade. It was about six hours long and went to every street in St. Louis. And I went past gay bars, and there were guys standing outside the bars wearing this shirt. I don't even know who they were. I don't know where they got the shirt. Anyway, we got the shirt. Little side story. Sorry. Little side story is the woman who sold us the shirt the first time 
mispriced it and told me the price was higher than it really was. And so when I went back to the group, I said, should we refund the money back to all these churches that bought the shirt? The community said, no. Most of the people who were from those churches were around the table. I said, no, just keep the money. It was a wonderful fundraiser we stumbled into unintentionally. And the woman who made him decided that if you have a blue shirt, you don't have to have blue ink. So they just need to color the shirt. If you have a green shirt, green, you know, it's green, you know, that way. So they screen printed, we, what does this have on the back? United Church of Christ. Okay, so we started out, one of our congregations wanted their name on the back. That church is First Congregational Church of Webster Groves, United Church of Christ. That's what they wanted to do. We did it because we're good people. A few years later, we're going to reprint the shirts, and the committee had changed a little bit, and they said, oh, no, just with the UCC website on it, let them find our churches that way. So then they started this. Uh, if you see it, a shirt that looks like this, it originated in St. Louis. We gave people in Toledo, and we gave people in some other cities permission to copy it and print the shirt, but the shirt is part of it. And so I thought I would wear this shirt, because you told me to wear white shorts and a and a Hawaiian shirt to this event, and I didn't get that done fast enough. And I thought, well, why not wear a Gateway OMA shirt? Sure. Thank you. Thank you all. So with the notes for their build up, I will invite Reverend Dr. Katrina Roseboro March. And all I can say is I tried. <laughs> Perfectly fine, but I mean, how do I follow along? Yeah. <laughs> Great to be with you today. Uh, Craig asked me to give some best practices. And I, I'm just curious. I, I want to start at this place. I, I'm not going to talk to you. I'd like you to talk with me. Is that OK? All right. And I want to know, what, what do you know about the Open and Affirming Coalition of the United Church of Christ? Just what do you know? Anybody? Helpful resource? For um, materials as you go through the process? Helpful resource, yes. Mostly known as building an inclusive church. Anyone else? That there is a process. That there is. Oh, there you go. There's something that can help you figure out how to do it, how you get there. There is sure. a process, yes. Anyone else? You've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> yes, the UCC <laughs> has been doing it for 51 years. 51. Anyone else? I want to start with what the gentleman said. Tell me, Daryl. Daryl said, it. and that there is a process because that is the number one best practice around becoming ONA. Now, as you know, I'm, I've only been there four months as of the 15th. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I, I really had some crash course learning, and I'm grateful that one of the first things that came up was, uh, you need to call Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren has been very helpful in my first days of it. But one of the interesting things that I have learned is that churches don't know that there is a process. And particularly if they're in a conference that is already ONA, they don't know that they too have to go through the process to become ONA certified. Did y'all know that? Yeah. And so what we have found out is that there are a lot of churches that claim to be ONA that have not been certified. So one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're getting that message out there that you must be certified in order to say that you're ONA. And we're taking that a step further. We are not only branding, we have trademarked, open and affirming. And we're going to become like the Michelin star. Like you have to get this Michelin star to say that you were open and affirming. Why? Because we have had stories of people who have gone to churches that have said they are ONA and welcoming and had traumatizing experiences. 
And so we have seen it that as the open and affirming coalition, what can we do to make sure that this is not happening to people? We have to step up. And if we're stepping up, it means you all are going to have to step up and go through the process. And not even just go through the process, but in what we're changing is very much what Lauren spoke about with how Gateway works. So that we're not just contacted in, the, in emergencies. My, my third day on the job, I received a call uh, from a church, a UCC church in California, where the Proud Boys had went to the home of a pastor. And they called me to see what to do on my third day. <laughs> so the other thing we're doing is we're putting together strategies for safety. We just had a workshop, an introductional workshop. You can go on YouTube to look at it, where we're talking about how do we make our congregations safe, particularly as ONA congregations. But we need to look at it at the local level. We need to look at it at the regional level. Because it's going to take all of us aligned together to make true, open, and affirming spaces what they say they are. So the other week, I'm cheat sheet, remember I'm four months. <laughs> the other thing is, we want to make sure that another great practice is knowing and understanding that being ONA is not just about affirming or being allies to the LGBTQIA+. It is for the differently abled. It is for the different cultures. It is for anyone who brings a part of themselves in a whole representation that has something or a belief that's different from you. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you too what, what that also means. Because this came up about day six. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? when a family comes and they say they practice polyamory. What are we going to do to that? Are we going to let them be in our congregation? Well, does ONA say that we have to let them in? This is real. And these are conversations that ONA will be starting to have. Because if we say we're open and affirming, right. and all are welcome, all means all. And if we're saying everyone is created in the image of God, and all are loved by God, and we love ourselves and we love our neighbor, then are we not to love them too? So these are the basics. I'm on time. You are fantastic. These are the basics. So we're creating a new structure within the ONA where um, they had coaches and consults. I think we're calling them now consultants. Coaches and consultants. We are going to be putting out a call for people who want to be coaches and consultants. And we're going to have a training. It's going to be for the local level and the regional level. So that when someone reaches out to us and say they want to be ONA, we have someone trained and already in place that we can call. Trained and in place. And we also are working at the conference level where we're going to ask the conference levels to identify an ambassador. And that ambassador will be connected directly with us 
so that we can know how can we help in your conference when it's not an emergency. We want to move beyond responding with an emergency situation and being prepared prior to it. So those are my basics I have for you today. Any questions? I yes. <laughs> That's a great question. You can go to our website. Everything you need is on our website. Be patient with us. We are redesigning the website. We will have a new website within six to eight weeks. We are so excited. We'll also have a new logo. We are completely rebranded. And on the website, you can, there are two tracks you can take. There's a track, the, the, the regular track is if you are a congregation and you have not really done this conversation, you need to go through the full track. However, if you're a congregation and you meet certain criteria that you'll see on the track, it's called the alternative track, such as you may have a pastor that's um, out as LGBTQIA and have had one for years, or if you, it, they'll even count uh, part of it, do you have a flag outside? You can even get some points for that. So there are different ways in which you can become certified. There's not going to be ongoing training. There will be ongoing steps. We're putting in place, well, what do I do once I become certified? And just like the checklist to become certified, there will be criteria that a church will have to do in order to stay certified. Does that make sense? Yeah, what I'm asking, like, say, for instance, okay, church is open and affirming. They have this um, situation come up, like, head up. Culture consulting go and provide a discussion and a training with that circumstance. Yes, if they if they want a church right. to. I just had a church on what's today? On Friday. <laughs> <laughs> they had applied and their vote was it was something like forty two to twenty five. And I said, we have to have a meeting. Because one, the first thing that comes up for me, that, that's a possible split, a church split. And so having that meeting, what, what we were able to identify is that they had not given space for the people who disagreed. This is a nugget. You must give space for the people who disagree. And so what we're doing is one of our coaches is going to go in with them and help them through the process and help them to have the conversations with those who don't agree. So yes, if the church is open to it, they can. If they're not open to it, then they're not going to be certified. And we're going through all of the 1,800 churches, and they're going to have to be recertified. Hint, hint. And that is mostly because when a lot of the churches were certified, there was not a lot of trans language during that time. And again, we want to make sure everybody is safe. So one of the
the challenges in conference work is when you look at a group like ours, what it looks like or what, how it needs to be ONA in Southwest Virginia or West Virginia or South Jersey looks different than Baltimore yes. or DC. How do we find that sweet spot where there's a, a sense of commonality of commitment and value, but a respect for locality and context in ministry, if that makes sense? That's a good question. And I'm gonna be honest, I, I get I, I pause a bit when a congregation asks how to find asks me how to find a sweet space, a sweet spot, because I don't know your people. So I start with let's have a conversation so that you can get to know your people to see what the commonalities are. Because if we're not talking to each other, how will we know? And that's the first place of starting the relationship to see how to move forward. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I just want to know, um, as somebody that runs support programs, um, if uh, I believe our church is already open and affirming, is there a benefit to this certification? Um, is there any financial aid for those of us that run these support programs and outreach programs? Great question. The, the benefit, first of all, is being connected with the UCC as an ONA church says that you're safe. That's, that's the first thing. The other piece of the benefit is, in terms of finances, there has not been before, but that also is something that we are working on as well as you utilizing a partnership with uh, other congregations and other ministries and programs that are already going for our webinars. Um, we offer webinars that, from my understanding, have been the number one uh, thing of how people have come to learn and hear what's, what's happening around all of UCC regarding open and affirming opportunities. So, question, um, if you have a church that says, well, uh, let me do it this way. My, my church, in Atlanta, Michigan, UCC, and DC, was founded 30 years ago um, by our bishop, who is Alvin Gay. He, it was founded on that premise, and actually founded on the 4th of July of that particular year, and he called it Independence Day. Um, in DC, one of the first churches, um, besides the ACC churches that were doing this, in the black community. So when we then joined UCC, it was a no-brainer that we were open to farming because that's, that was our foundation. So then we found out about the process, we are getting a call, and say, well, you know, it was really a certification thing. But we went through that, right, to do that. The question I have is for churches like that or others that may say, well, uh, or churches that are on the edge and say, we embrace the principles of it, but we're not yet ready to be that designation. And are there provisions for people to be able to say that they embrace an open and affirming um, philosophy towards ministry and they're welcoming people without saying I'm an ONA certified entity? Are you guys, are you all thinking about that hybrid somewhere in between those spots where a church may be on its road, um, but for whatever the reasons are, are not quite ready to do the process? We have not thought about that in terms of what you're saying, in terms of a hybrid. We have thought about it in terms of how do we identify those churches that are in the middle so that we can come and have conversations with them and see, well, what, what is the resistance? What is the resistance to, yes, we'll do this, but we don't want to say we're going in. So no, we have not, but yes, we have regarding we want, we want to be, we want churches to be in a place again where everyone that comes in, we can say they're safe. They are connected with us and they're safe. And again, that Michelin star is what's going to do it so people will know I can go here just as I am. I don't know which one. Both of you, and it's, I think, a 
church like ours engaged in this one particular issue, but many more, would really benefit from a, a cohort of other churches who are in the struggle. And um, a model that Israel, Palestine, uh, Palestine Israel Network that I'm part of, um, we just did a solidarity circle of about 10 people to provide a space for pastors and lay leaders to talk about the issues that our church is committed to. I feel like I, and I think other members of my church, would really benefit from some in-house conversation now, uh, especially around the trans non-binary issue, because it's not necessarily given that the LGBTQIA community is completely accepting of the trans non-binary addition. I was, first I was quite shocked, I was like, what? And, and it's not quite there. So there's just lots of things, especially as we look at the public square, and as one of the leaders said, women's reproductive rights going after trans youth is like this. Yes. So, so I hope you, I don't know if that's what you were getting at, but I would love to see such a thing I know other churches who are like us. Yes, again, four months and we're putting <laughs> all this stuff in, in place. Bear with us, and I'd love to have a conversation with you um, about your ideas about how it should look. Okay. So, I'm prepared and ask. Um, so, a lot of churches within and without, like um, there are with of the UCC say they're open in the front. It, I haven't known it to be specific to the UCC. So are you saying that unless you are certified, you cannot stay within the UCC your open and affirming um, congregation or faith community? This is going to be within the UCC and out. The coalition is in covenant with the UCC, but we're also an independent 501c3. So we don't only certify UCC churches. We certify universities, we certify organizations, not just the UCC. Okay. So the difference would be a certified ONA versus someone saying, we're open and we accept it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mark, they won't be able Right. They won't be. In a few more days. <laughs> he just said he liked his style. <laughs> but the, um, so like we're number 1517 and 1518. Rivers, New York and New Jersey uh, technically is certified, but I think that the question that I want to ask is in terms of recertification and in terms of the training. I think that that's very important, the point you made in reference to transgenders and gender non-conforming people and, and, and all of that not being a part of the first wave of what was going on. And so in that training process, are you going to have um, people, because let me just say, me being an out pastor, it's pretty easy for my church to become an ONA church. But for a church that's going through the process, like y'all said, it is halfway there, not all the way there. The kinds of people that you're going to go and have to train, I'm just interested in what you're going to be looking for in terms of consultants and, and, and other like. Because I don't, here is my, to my point, for someone at, like myself who it was easy for it to be done, I, I know that I can that's not necessarily walk into another church and it be so easy and I, and I necessarily be the right person to do it. So I'm just looking for the criteria and you know what, what you're looking for in those people to help train. We have not laid out the full criteria, but there will the trainers will be trans. And we Excellent. have already partnered with one Christian organization, Transmission, that will be doing some of the training for us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
in a positive way, I hope our heads are a little bit of spinning from the workshop so that we see new ways or new lens to look at open and firm. That it can be a, a, a key piece of revitalization as it was in Montclair. That it can be the voice in our local schools for justice and safety and inclusion. That it can be a regional bellwether uh, pulling folks together. So thank you all for laying out the vision. We're gonna take a little bit of a break. The musicians are kind of headed down around the corner. We're gonna reconvene in about 12 minutes for worship. And uh, so stretch those legs, take bathroom breaks, whatever you need to, and we'll see you back in a few minutes. Thank you.